Hey, welcome and thanks for joining me on this journey to the cross of Christ and to the celebration of his resurrection, as we call it, Easter. And last week we looked at the triumphal presentation of the king, and this week we're looking at the king cleans house. And of course we're talking about the symbolic cleansing of the temple. And it is a statement of judgment on the temple. And we're looking at Mark. Now Mark does something throughout his gospel is called sandwiching. He, he will take uh, something, put something else, and then put the same thing that he started with behind that. And both of those speak to what is in the middle and is a sandwich that he makes. Um, today, we're looking at, as Jesus goes toward the temple, there's the cursing of the fig tree, which for what some reason people have a lot of problem with, and then the actual uh, cleansing of the temple, the purifying of the temple, and, and a pronouncement of judgment on the temple as well, which gets the Sanhedrin, oh, so you're saying this is us. And then um, we won't look at it, but we'll, we'll mention it. The, the sandwich, the back end of the sandwich is the uh, coming upon the fig tree that's withered up, and that is the judgment that's taking place on the temple and the fruitlessness of the temple and Israel itself and not being what Israel was called to be. So as we look at that, we're going to be looking at Mark chapter 11, and we're going to begin in the 11th verse and to the 14th today. And the 11th verse just gets us from the triumphal presentation and entry into Jerusalem goes back to Bethany and then comes back. And on the way, there's this fig tree incident that we're going to talk about today. And he entered, Jesus, Jerusalem and came into the temple. And after looking all around, he departed for Bethany with the 12 since it was already late. And on the next day, when they had departed from Bethany, he became hungry. And seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, which means full leaves, it's got leaves all over it. He went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it, And this is the enigmatic phrase that Mark puts in there, for it was not the season for figs. And he answered and said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And the disciples were listening. Okay, right up front, Jesus is acting out. This is an object lesson for his disciples and for anyone else who would hear that this is exactly what's going to happen to Israel and the magnificent temple if these folks didn't straighten out, if these folks didn't receive him as Messiah, then what he is going to tell them is this is going to all be torn down. It's all fruitless. Uh, it's got all the leaves and it promises fruit, but there's not fruit there. And so as we look at this, you have to keep in mind that he's acting out a parable. It's not like, oh, what a mean, he just curses that fig tree. It's not the fig tree's fault because there's not supposed to be figs there and, and he shouldn't expect that tree to do something it shouldn't do. Um, here's something that you probably don't know. Um, well, we'll get to that in a second. What's the significance of the fig tree uh, and Israel? There's a, there's a link there between the two. One, the fig tree represents peace and security as provided by Yahweh. Over and over again in scripture, it says, and each, each man sat under his own vine and under his own fig tree. Um, the grapevine, the fig tree representing the provision of God, security and safety and prosperity um, that is provided by God. And so to have your own fig tree and for it to be producing shade and producing fruit was to show um security and peacefulness as provided by Yahweh. The fruit itself represents uh, God providing for his people. To have an abundance of figs uh, is to be not only in safety and security, but to have the blessing and provision of God in your life. And then the third thing is that throughout scripture, the fig tree represents Israel itself, um, good and bad. If you're talking about rotten figs, if you're talking about the fig tree not having figs, then the state of Israel is bad. If you're talking about the fig tree uh, as a blessing and producing, then the state of Israel is good. And of course, the good and bad states of Israel is dependent upon Israel's faithfulness to Yahweh, faithfulness to being what they were called to be. And so that's the significance of the fig tree. Now, 
This is something I didn't know about fig trees until I went to the Holy Land in Israel. Um, the fig tree produces figs before it produces leaves. I didn't know that. Um, now, some of those don't ripen up. Some of those will fall off. But the fact of the matter is the figs start being produced. I have pictures of them because I was there during the spring. I have pictures of them. Uh, the, the figs are already developing on the trees before the leaves come out. The leaves are just budding out and the figs are already there. So, yes, it's not time for the summer fig harvest, but people would eat the green figs, still do eat the green figs. Uh, there's a special name for them, uh, and the natives there still eat them. I'm sure it's a developed taste because it wouldn't be sweet and delicious like uh, ripened figs are. Um, but they eat green almonds over there, too, and those are supposed to be delicious. I, I like roasted almonds, I, and I eat those regularly, but... I've never had any green almonds, and I hadn't had green figs either. Uh, but they love them, and that's what, they, and, and so they eat them. So Jesus has every expectation with this fully leaved out tree of finding something to eat on this tree, finding some fruit. It should have some fruit on it, even though it's not time for the summer harvest, as he points out. Even though it's not time for the summer harvest, this tree is acting like it's got fruit and should be producing fruit. There should be something there, but there's not. Um, so, yeah. And so this becomes a, a figure of Israel uh, and the temple services. That this magnificent temple, like this tree that has all these leaves on it, should be producing fruit. The temple should be producing fruit. As Jesus is going to talk about, the nations are supposed to be able to come and worship God there, but there's this hindrance to the nations doing that. And of course, there are a couple of, of important prophecies that Jesus, I'm sure, has in mind and that the Jewish people around during this time, you know, this is time of Passover. There are thousands of people out here, and it wasn't just the disciples, just, okay, Jesus, the 12, and his fig tree. There are thousands of people. Uh, Joachim Jeremias estimated, he was a famous scholar and historian, estimated that at the time of Jesus, there would be more than 180,000 people around Jerusalem. Normal population of Jerusalem, 30,000. Increased to 180,000, maybe more, around, camped around Jerusalem throughout the Kidron Valley and, and on the way from Bethany to the temple, uh, there's this fig tree. And then there's more than just the 12, that's this lonely fig tree in Jesus. There are people everywhere. You can't walk for being people everywhere. So it's not just the disciples that overheard this. It's other people that heard this as well and saw it. And so the, here's the important prophecies. One is Micah 7, 1. Listen to this. Woe is me, for I am like the fruit pickers and the grape gatherers. There is not a cluster of grapes to eat or a first ripe fig which I crave. The godly person has perished from the land. There is no upright person among men. All of them lie in wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other with a net. Concerning evil, both hands do it well. The prince asks also the judge for a bribe. And a great man speaks the desire of his soul. So they weave it together. They weave all that together and it produces evil. And so certainly Jesus in looking for this fig is like God looking for fruit from Israel but finding none. And that just as judgment was going to come on Judah, so judgment is going to come on Jerusalem and certainly on the temple cultists and the high priestly group, uh, the, the Sanhedrin, the leaders of Israel, because they have led it to this fruitless state. Um, the second thing, I mean, the third thing, uh, second prophecy is this, Jeremiah 8, 12 uh, and 13. And in Jeremiah, God is speaking of the people of, of Judah and saying they ought to be ashamed of their sins, their idolatry, their evil, but they're not. This was, were they ashamed because of the abomination they had done? They certainly were not ashamed, and they did not know how to blush. In other words, they'd lost their ability to blush. Nothing shamed them anymore. Nothing shocked. Sounds a lot like the United States. Nothing shames us. Uh, we don't blush. 
Therefore they shall fall among those who fall. At the time of their punishment they shall be brought down, declares the Lord. I will surely snatch them away, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine and no figs on the fig tree, and the leaf shall wither, and what I have given them shall pass away. So what we will see is the withering of the fig tree sandwiched between the judgment upon and the purification and the and the and the declaration of judgment upon the temple cultists, the, the, the high priestly caste, and and what was going on in the temple. So those two scriptures are certainly in the mind of Jesus as he's illustrating the judgment that's going to come on Israel because this fig tree symbolizes Israel as it always does. And there should be fruit because it's in full leaf, but there's not any. Not, none of the first fruit is there that should be there, but they haven't produced it. Um, they just have the leaves that look like there should be fruit. The temple and its magnificence ought to be producing the fruit. And the fruit is obedience, but it, the fruit is the nations coming to God through that. And we'll see that some more tomorrow. Judgment is really against the Jewish leaders uh, for leading Israel into this. And by the way, um, throughout Israel's history, it is the king that uh, brings purification to the temple and renewal to the temple and the cleansing of the temple. And so Jesus, as the King of Kings, and certainly the promised Davidic King, who is the Messiah, comes to do that very thing. Um, and to cleanse us and make us image bearers of God, where we become a temple in and of ourselves because the Holy Spirit dwells in us uh, to purify us and to cleanse us as well. I think you can make that jump from the cleansing of the physical temple to the cleansing of us to be the temple of God where the Holy Spirit resides in us. How marvelous is that and how cool is that? Well, I hope you learned something about fig trees, uh, but mostly I hope you learn that um, God expects to find fruit in our lives and there should be fruit in our lives. And of course, what is that fruit? Well, the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit that's supposed to be being produced in our lives. So if we have all the trappings of being believers, like going to church, uh, teaching Sunday school, going to Sunday school, going to small groups, having discipleship, and yet there's no fruit in our lives of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, then rightly we should be chastised uh, for our condition as well. And remember this, that God uh, chastens those whom he loves. So if you are a believer and the fruit is not being produced like it should be, the scripture tells us that he will prune, trim out that which is hindering that growth and uh, so that we can produce fruit and that he does that because he loves us. Hey, I hope you realize that, that God loves you. We're going to talk some more about this tomorrow and hopefully it'll make sense as we complete the sandwich where you have this beginning piece of bread, if you want to look at it that way, the fig tree, and then the cleansing, I'll put that in quotes, air quotes, cleansing of the temple, uh, and then the, the second part, the second piece of bread of the sandwich is the withered fig tree, which covers the scope of those two prophecies, uh, Micah and Jeremiah, that we read and looked at today. Okay. That's uh, that will conclude us for today. We're gonna it'll make sense as we go through it. I know I'm pulling something almost out of context, but you'll get the rest as we go through it, um, where you get the temple and then the fig tree, and I'll bring the the other part of the fig tree in it by the end of the week. We'll get that done. So anyway, thanks for joining me as we take this journey to the cross and to the celebration of Easter. And I pray that you know that God loves you because He loves you so much He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him receives Him has forgiveness of sin, eternal life, and joy indescribable right here and right now. I pray that that's yours. Because if it is, if you possess a Savior, you possess those three certainties. And another one, the peace of God that surpasses understanding shall be yours, his shalom. Wholeness and completeness. Assurance that God is in control and working things out. And he is. So rest assured, be at peace, be at peace, be not afraid. Jesus is with us. And God is working it all out. Hey, listen, see you tomorrow. Till then, may God's shalom rest upon you. God bless you. See you tomorrow.